Warning. Contains adult content, including harsh language, violence, and sexual themes, and may not be suitable for people under age 17. Alright, time to tell off Buns. Buns? Eliza opened the next door without knocking. The place looked as though it had been abandoned years ago. There was hardly any light, absolutely no furniture, the kitchen was void of any types of appliances or utensils, and the stained carpet was littered with glass beer bottles, some broken. A figure, about five foot two, sat on a wooden stool in the far corner, its back to them. It was hunched over, so Tilly couldn't make a guess as to what it was. Bunny, come on, Eliza scolded in frustration. You've got to stop drinking so much. It rose its arm, and instead of having a hand, it had a large, rather cute paw. It was holding something rectangular. Do you know what this is? He spoke in very slurred words, and it was obvious he was drunk. Looks like peeps, said Eliza emotionlessly. Yeah, Bunny drawled. You know a shade there in? From here, they look like ghosts. He suddenly whipped around, eyelids droopy and waving the pack of peeps in the air. Tilly gasped, seeing that the thing was a giant humanoid rabbit, almost as if it was wearing a mascot costume. His light pink fur was dirty and matted, and he swayed on his stool. Ghosts! He exclaimed. These little babies are supposed to be chicks or rabbits, and now they've got peeps for all the other holidays, too! They got Christmas trees and pumpkins and God knows what else. There are Valentine's Day hearts, Tilly muttered, and the Easter Bunny gave a cry of indignation. Valentine's Day hearts? There's a joke! Buns, come on, said Eliza. People still celebrate Easter. It's not just about peeps. You've got lots of other candy. And what about the baskets? There are baskets for other holidays, too. He gave a brief hiccup. Kids get all their toys in the baskets. What are they, bunnies? No, and they're not even duck or sheeps. You know who's getting the dough around here? That fat ass Santa Claus. <laughs> Living up there in this big cozy mansion with his hot wife. Yeah, he ditched his fat wife and got a hot one. And he don't even have to make them toys himself. He got elves to do it. If you just get out there and show people you care about them and not the money, you'd be employed again. But I do only care about the money. Those people can suck my carrot. And by carrot, I mean my dick. Eliza sighed heavily, rubbing her temples, smearing some of her foundation and revealing a spot of nothingness. Then you need to change that, don't you think? She grumbled. Bunny made mock talking motions with his paw. They don't care about me, so I don't care about them, he spat out. All I need is my booze and my thinking thing with my head. Brain, Tilly suggested. What? Slurred Bunny. With that, he fell face first onto the floor, completely passed out. <sighs> that was pleasant, Eliza groaned sarcastically. The twins are going to be a cakewalk after that. Tilly didn't even bother to voice her curiosity, for she didn't think anything could surprise her more than everything else she had seen. She was wrong. The next apartment was unlike any of the others, being a black-and-white checkered hallway that seemed to go on forever, much further than there was room for in the building. It was also curving into a helix very slowly, making it sort of hard to focus on where the floor began and where the walls ended. Oh no, Eliza muttered. Guys, come on! This is important! There was the sound of two children laughing, but it echoed from very far away. Ugh, I hate it when they do this! She gently took Tilly's hand, coaxing her into the room. Before closing the door, Eliza took a spool of thread from her pocket, tied the end to the doorknob, and put the spool back in its previous home. Upon shutting the door, Tilly yelped as it vanished, the hallway expanding past the place it had been standing. However, the doorknob hovered in midair, the string still tied to it. Whatever you do, no matter what you see or hear, do not let go of my hand. Understand? Tilly nodded, and they slowly began walking down the hall. It almost seemed as though they were simply walking in place, for nothing appeared to be getting closer, not even the helix. 
The checkers were giving Tilly a headache, so she closed her eyes for a minute or two, letting Eliza lead her. She heard giggling again, and then a pair of voices singing. Things are not what they appear, Extremely creeped out, Tilly opened her eyes just in time to see the entire scene change. Eliza stopped abruptly, and they found themselves standing on an enormous red cylinder floating in black space. Looking around, Tilly saw more giant shapes carelessly suspended in midair, all in primary colors. What do we do? Tilly squeaked, trying not to look down into the endless void. Guys, please! This isn't funny! Eliza called, but was met with no reply. Seeing a yellow cube floating by, she quickly turned to Tilly. Do exactly as I say as soon as I say it, okay? Unable to speak, Tilly nodded, and they carefully came to the edge of the cylinder. On the count of three, jump onto the cube. One, two... Tilly was absolutely terrified, but she jumped with Eliza as soon as she said, Three! They barely made it, but they did so successfully. It was mental torment, having to try and jump on shapes that were either decently farther away from them or too difficult to cling onto. There were even times when they had to fall a few feet down to reach the next object. Eliza's string never parted from her, stretching impossibly far behind them. As the two of them hopped toward an upside-down pyramid, it vanished, as did the rest of the shapes, as they plummeted into blackness, screaming all the way down. With a massive plop, Tilly and Eliza sank deep into a mound of green jello the size of a shed. It was sticky and goopy and rather difficult to dig out of, but they managed it, falling to the floor a foot below their escape point. Things are not what they appear, Another verse of the song came from nowhere as they stood up. Now Tilly and Eliza were in a desert, except the sand was light pink and the sky was a dull purple. Instead of clouds, there were eyeballs with lids and long eyelashes, and were watching the girls, blinking every so often. Eliza? Tilly said nervously as they continued their journey. Where are we? Who lives here? Loki and Eris, Eliza replied softly. They look around twelve or thirteen, identical twins, even though they are different gender, and like to cause mischief and chaos. So, this is like a game to them? asked Tilly, seeing a two-headed lizard scuttle past. Yup, Eliza replied, and it's not funny! She said that last part loudly so that the children could hear her. They were met with more giggles. Just then, they screamed again as the sand transformed into a deep whirlpool, sucking them down in an instant. They landed on a pile of oversized pillows, and watching them with identical smirks on their faces were a young boy and girl. Their hair was navy blue and appeared to be the exact same length and style, but the girl had hers in pigtails, a white bow on her left parietal ridge. The twins' eyes were shockingly gold and very shiny, almost like foil, and their skin was a light shade of tan. The girl wore a white lacy dress that went just past her knees, white stockings, and little white dress shoes. Her brother also wore all white, but his shirt was a button-up long sleeve shirt with a modest collar, and his pants looked like denim. His canvas shoes were also white. Hello, Hello Eliza, Eliza, the children said in the exact same tone and in perfect unison. The only way Tilly could tell that it wasn't just one voice was the difference in pitch, making them sound very eerie. Did that amuse you? Eliza asked, hand still glued to Tilly's. Yes, yes, they replied simultaneously. It was a surprise to welcome the human, chirped the girl, who was presumably Eris. Did you have fun, Tilly? asked Loki mockingly. How did you know my name? Tilly asked tentatively. We, we know, know everything, everything, past, present, and future, the twins said together. We see all, we hear all, and we can bend reality to our liking. 
And you know very well not to do that unprovoked, Eliza exclaimed. We just wanted to show off, Eris whimpered with a pout, shuffling her tiny feet. We didn't mean to do anything wrong. Bull, Eliza snapped. You can see right through us, sang Loki. It's funny because you're the invisible one. If you don't behave, Eliza said, and Tilly was shocked at how soft and calm she had become. I'll let Allison come and play with you. Expressions of utter horror washed over the twins' faces, and their hands clasped to each other like magnets. You wouldn't, they both squeaked. You know the rules, so follow them, or find another place to live, said Eliza firmly. And good luck, you won't find another place that will take you. We'll be good, the twins muttered together. Excellent. Well, since you obviously know Tilly, can you send us back to the house? With a simultaneous nod, Eliza's thread became taut, and her and Tilly were yanked backward at a miraculous speed. In less than a second, they crashed through the door, back into the hall of the boarding house's second floor, and then it slammed shut. Tilly thought she heard giggling before it closed. Standing and dusting themselves off, Eliza broke the thread and stuck it in her pocket with the spool. Her expression became very serious when she met Tilly's eyes, and then jerked her head to follow her. They came to the steel door, which had a padlock. Eliza entered a six-digit code, and a loud mechanical bang was heard before she opened the door. It was at least three inches thick, but immediately following was a second steel door, this one having three different shaped locks. Eliza pulled out a key ring and quickly unlocked it, and then came to a third door. This one had a strange latch that looked impossible to figure out, but Eliza did it in about a second. Close all three doors behind you, Eliza ordered, and Tilly did so, hearing each one lock in succession. The room was about half as big as the regular-sized apartments, but the floor and walls were a blinding white. It was illuminated with fluorescent rectangles in the ceiling, and immediately in front of them was a massive glass sphere sitting on a metal platform. In front was a very complicated set of buttons and levers on a dashboard, and on the right wall, a large computer screen. What? What is that? Tilly whispered, pointing to the figure suspended in the glass orb. It appeared to be a girl curled up like a fetus, arms wrapped tightly around her legs, knees held to her chest. Her skin was light silver, and her snow-white hair was so long it looked as though it exceeded her own height. It billowed around her like silk cloth underwater. The girl was also wearing what looked like a one-piece black bathing suit. Tilly saw that her eyes, which had long white eyelashes, were gently closed, and she assumed that the girl was asleep. This is Allison, Eliza explained in a quiet voice. She is kept in stasis because she is incredibly dangerous. What is she? asked Tilly. A government experiment, Eliza replied. She was spliced to create a biogenetically engineered weapon, but they lost control of her. When they managed to throw her back into stasis, they had no idea how to destroy her safely, but they also did not want to risk another rampage at Area 51. So instead, they donated her to my family about two generations ago, and they provided us with specific containment procedures, what to do in case of an outbreak, possible methods to control her long enough to put her back to sleep, and so on. Eliza pointed to a large red button, bigger than the others. Never, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever push that big button. It wakes her up and opens her container. What will she do? asked Tilly, astounded. The problem is, she's unpredictable, said Eliza. She is the only known creature on this earth to be able to use 100% of her brain, and she will do what she wants. She could wake up calm or start destroying everything in sight, including other living beings. Not only that, but she can switch between docile to hostile without warning, no matter what happens around her. Eliza now pointed to a green button, which was slightly smaller than the big red button next to it. That wakes her up just enough to have a conversation with her. We feel that if she gets some social attention, maybe she'll calm down. But if she tries to convince you to let her out, no matter what she says, don't do it. May I speak to her now? Tilly said before she could stop herself. Usually, I would say no, but I think it's appropriate for her to meet you. Eliza led Tilly to the dashboard and pressed the green button. A white mist filled the chamber, and the girl slowly lowered to the base of the glass. After a few seconds, the mist dissipated, and Allison lifted her head. Flinching in shock, Tilly saw that Allison's scleras were black, whereas her irises were as white as her hair, having no pupil. 
Despite being quite alarming, she was absolutely gorgeous, her long hair falling gracefully around her face and body. She moved close to the front, staring unblinkingly at Tilly, pressing the palm of her right hand to the glass. Who are you? she cooed. Allison's voice was like music, and it sent chills through Tilly's body. She felt like she was in love with this girl, and she wanted nothing more than to release her from her prison, hold her tight in her arms, and never let go. Eliza grabbed Tilly's wrist to stop her from pressing the red button, which she hadn't realized she was doing. Fight it, she hissed. Allison never took her eyes off of Tilly, who felt like she had a golf ball in her throat. Who are you? the girl repeated. I'm Tilly, she replied, voice wavering. When Allison smiled, it was as if time had stopped, and nothing but peace existed. Tilly felt Eliza's hand tremble, as if she too was trying to keep from letting Allison out. Will you be my friend? I'll be your anything, Tilly squeaked, her voice cracking. I will never leave your side if you let me out, Allison purred. That's enough, Allison, Eliza croaked, pulling Tilly to stand on her other side. Stop trying to get people to let you out. I just want to love everyone, said Allison, and her expression was so sad, Tilly felt as though she would start sobbing. The last person who fell for that ended up getting massacred by you, said Eliza, also sounding close to tears. I just want to love everyone. This time, Allison's voice became low and menacing, and ultimate fear washed over Tilly. Now she wanted to get as far away from this thing as possible. When you can behave, I will consider letting you out. It was obvious that Eliza had also been stricken with spontaneous and near uncontrollable fear. I'm putting you back to sleep. Please don't, Allison whined once again changing Tilly's mood to complete misery. I love you, Eliza. I just want to. Eliza had slammed her palm against the green button, and more mist was shot into the sphere. Allison went limp, and when the mist cleared once more, Tilly saw her body curl back into the fetal position and hover in the center of the orb. She was asleep. My God, Tilly gasped, her emotions stabilizing. What just happened? One of her abilities is to control other people's feelings, Eliza replied, sounding very tired. Her beauty first captures you, and, man or woman, adult or child, straight or otherwise, you fall in love with her. After that, she can push her own emotions onto you, but you feel them fifty times stronger. It's difficult to build a tolerance to it, but eventually it won't affect you as badly, unless she touches you. What happens then? Eliza began opening the door so that they could leave. If your skin comes in contact with hers, you can't move. The metal doors were locked one by one until they were in the hall once more. You can't think, you can't register anything you're seeing, you can't hear or touch, only breathe. There's no way to recover from it that we know of, but not many people have survived it because Allison kills you once you're paralyzed. It's a bloody mess, literally. How many are still alive? Tilly inquired as she followed Eliza up a smaller flight of stairs, which she assumed led to the attic. Three, Eliza said sadly. All of them were attacked at Area 51, and they are currently being kept there to make sure they stay alive, as well as try and find a way to wake them up. We think Allison can do it, but will she? Not likely. We had one resident here who was stupid enough to take her out. He was half cat. We didn't know where he had gone, so when I went to check on Allison, the entire room was splattered with blood, and Allison was snuggling the boy's severed head like a kitten. Fortunately, she was content enough to let me put her back to sleep, which is rare. Raz nearly lost his head. Why? Since he's a vampire, he could smell the blood, and when he's tempted, he potentially could start slaughtering people too. He's smart, though. He locks himself in the basement when he's ravenous, and eventually a ghost will come tell us to let him out. The ghosts live in the basement. You'll see them around. Raz is also the only one who is not affected by Allison's control over emotions. Talking about Miss Bioweapon? Said a pleasant male voice, and Tilly jumped, glancing around. She hadn't realized they had reached the attic, which was large, though the ceiling was low and very clean. A tall, thin man lay on a futon that was pulled out into a bed, and he had a magazine open in his hands. Upon seeing the girls, he set it down and stood up. For the thousandth time, Tilly was amazed beyond belief. This man had to be about five foot six, his knee-high boots adding an extra inch. 
The most noticeable thing was that his skin was a smooth turquoise color, the shaggy yet attractive hair on his head an extremely vibrant red. Like the fairies, he had pointed ears, but they were less pronounced, as well as being pierced with four pink rings. The man's right eye looked normal, save for the purple iris, but the left was black like Allison's. The difference was, his iris was yellow and still had a pupil. The clothes he was wearing were shockingly feminine. There was a black cut-off shirt with one sleeve on the right, which was rolled up to the elbow. Where the other sleeve should have been was a tank top strap. It also appeared to be leather, with a few minor rips patched with black mesh. The pants were of the same material, the right leg having a single mesh-patched rip, and the left with an open segment running from the thigh down past his boots, horizontal straps stretching across the gap. The man wore black gloves that came up to the elbow, also having straps like his pants, and the only fingers covered were the middle and ring finger. Lastly, there was a black collar with pink metal clasp, a matching belt, green buckled band on his left upper arm, hanging green suspenders attached to the loops on his pants, and a few oddly placed green straps on his boots. Wow, Tilly couldn't help but whisper as the man walked up to them. Yes, we just spoke to Allison, Eliza said, replying to his previous question. Scary stuff, huh? He asked Tilly, and she nodded slowly. My name is Genesis, but you can call me Jen. I'm Tilly. Um, what are you? Jen laughed, running his fingers through his hair. Well, to you Earthlings, I'm an alien, but if you were on my planet, you'd be the alien, he explained. I come from a planet called Phara, which is in the galaxy that has been named Bode's Galaxy here on Earth. It's interesting what you guys call some stuff out there. What do you call it? Tilly asked. The supposed Bode's Galaxy is actually called the Aurora's Eye Galaxy, said Jen. It was clear he was an intellectual. The name came from the astronomer Zykali Moxus Aurora, who discovered it in our year 1326, way earlier than your astronomer found it. Zykali was from Solicent, the second planet in our solar system, Phara being the fourth. Of course, the inhabitants of Aurora's Eye knew all about life on other planets for millions of years, and have progressed to visiting other galaxies. I studied the Milky Way galaxy in college, and was specifically interested in Earth. It seems you're the only planet within 13 billion light years that hasn't discovered life on other planets. Jen blinked, and then grimaced. Uh, I don't want to bore you with sciencey stuff. No, Tilly exclaimed excitedly. I'm very much enjoying this. Oh, okay. Jen cleared his throat, and then continued. I knew it'd be cool to study Earth firsthand, but according to our research that tells us you haven't gotten quite far in space travel, an alien showing up would cause an uproar and probably result in my death. But I wanted to go, so I focused my studies on the human race to figure out how they behave and started saving up money to take a trip out here. When I finally could afford it, I arrived, but had to do a lot of hiding until I could find a way to blend in. Well, I couldn't find that way without help, so I used the computer in my ship to lock into your internet and do more, yep, you guessed it, research. And I found this place. With the help of makeup advice from the others that need to blend in, I can go out and mingle with humans briefly. But I like to stick to our markets. I only interact with humans for study. I'm human, said Tilly, and as she suspected, Genesis's eyes widened, and he got so excited it was like he was a kid in a candy shop. I had no idea. You must let me observe you. Jen, Eliza exclaimed, and Tilly jumped, having forgotten that she was there. Don't use her as your guinea pig. What's a guinea pig? asked Jen, and Tilly giggled. I'll let you observe me sometime, she told the alien, but no tests or experiments. Oh, definitely not. That would be cruel, said Jen. Then he gestured to his room, which had a lot of lab equipment designed specifically for biological study. There were quite a lot of things Tilly did not recognize. There was also a writing desk with a laptop on it, a small bookcase that looked a bit too full of books, and a clothing dresser. I keep my space clean and organized. You'll have to let me know if you have any allergies, what medications you take, physical or mental conditions. Okay, Jen, Eliza laughed. It's getting late. Tilly and I have to wrap things up. You'll have plenty of time to get acquainted. Woo! A human I don't have to hide from! Genesis cheered, and the girls descended the stairs, Tilly laughing at his enthusiasm. He's amazing, she told Eliza, continuing back to the first floor. Earth seems so... dumb after hearing all of that. Before Eliza could retort, Tilly bumped into something about the size of a dog, nearly tripping. 
Hey, watch where you're going! shouted a gruff voice, and Tilly recomposed herself, backing up to see what she had almost fallen over. She was speechless.